morning and welcome. I'm Amy Loprest. I'm the Executive Director of the New York City Campaign Finance Board. And I want to welcome you all to today's conference, American Elections at the Crossroads. And we are indeed at a crossroads. The flood of money into our electoral process is at an all-time high. But voter turnout continues to be disappointing at best, dispiriting at worst. And Americans of, from all sides of the political spectrum agree that these two are related, that the moneyed interest have too much influence over our elections and our elected officials. If Americans feel that their elected officials answer more to these special interests than to the electorate, then our democracy truly is broken. Here in New York City, we have had the Small Donor Matching Funds program that has been working successfully for almost 27 years. You will hear a lot today about that program and how it encourages candidates to seek contributions from regular New Yorkers by incentivizing those contributions with a six to one match. In the 2013 municipal elections, we distributed $38.2 million in public funds. These public funds match contributions from New Yorkers in every part of the city. However, New York City still has struggled with the influx of independent spending and low voter turnout. Today, we've assembled an all-star group of moderators and panelists to discuss these problems, how we got here, and what can be done to return our democracy to the people. We're also happy to have Anne Ravel, the chair of the Federal Election Commission, as our keynote speaker. Um, each panel will allow time for questions, so we really, really hope to engage in a discussion and hear uh, spirited questions from all of you. I, finally, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the co-sponsors of this uh, conference, the Brennan Center for Justice and the Committee for Economic Development. And finally, if you are tweeting, uh, we have a hashtag dedicated for this event. It is at hashtag elections, capital R, number four, voters. Elections are for voters. Um, I, I now turn to Larry Norton, the Deputy Director of, of the Democracy Program, to start off our program. Uh, thanks, Amy, and um, thank you, everybody, for being here today. I, I think it's going to be a very interesting day. Uh, before I start, uh, I do want to thank the staff of the Campaign Finance Board for all the work that they uh, put into this event, especially uh, Matt Solars and Eric Friedman. Um, I, don't, I don't see them, but I'm sure they're here. <laughs> um, and, uh, and to, and, and to uh, J Jeffrey Yudin, who, uh, who put a lot of work in, uh, and she's at the Brennan Center into this event. Um, so uh, I am here, it is my distinct pleasure uh, to introduce uh, someone who really needs no introduction in this room, and that's Fritz Schwartz. Um, I think it's fair to say, uh, if it wasn't for Fritz, we might not be here today. Um, Fritz's accomplishments in uh, private practice and public service are uh, manifold and far too many. In 1989, he chaired uh, the successful Charter Revision Commission, which substantially revised uh, New York City's charter. He has authored at least three books, um, uh, including most recently, Democracy in the Dark, The Seduction of Government Secrecy, um, and I urge af all, after this is over, all of you to go to Amazon and buy it. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, Fritz has uh, worked at the Brennan Center since uh, two 2002. Uh, among many other accomplishments, he helped to successfully defend uh, the electioneering provisions of the Ma McCain-Feingold uh, campaign finance law in the U.S. Supreme Court in the case McConnell versus FEC. Uh, as chief counsel at the Brennan Center, Fritz has served uh, as a leader uh, and a mentor um, to many of the attorneys and staff, and um, I'm honored to include myself among those. So getting back to why we're here today and what Fritz has to do with it, um, back in the mid-80s, well into Mayor Koch's uh, second term, uh, the city was rocked by a series of corruption scandals. Uh, the instinct for many politicians um, under those circumstances would probably be to, um, to try to distance themselves from uh, those scandals and to minimize them. Uh, but Fritz urged the mayor uh, to grab the opportunity to push for uh, comprehensive government reform. 
Um, that eventually led his successor, uh, Peter Zimroth, and others to pass the, the New York City campaign public financing system, um, which uh, is a, focus, a big focus of our, our conversations today. Uh, and after that was passed into law, Fritz led the Citizens Commission uh, that helped to get the public financing system put into the city charter. In 2003, he became just the second chair of the campaign finance board in New York City, uh, and he remained in that position until 2008. During that time, he oversaw some of the biggest changes in the city's campaign finance laws, um, and I'm sure that uh, he'll tell us a little bit more about that in his remarks. So uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Fritz Schwartz. Um, thanks so much, Larry. Thank you all for being here. Thanks to the Campaign Finance Board, co-sponsoring, wonderful place, come back to it. Thanks to the Committee for um, Economic Development, which helped to try and get New York State to reform, which we haven't succeeded in doing yet. And thanks to the Brennan Center, where, as Larry said, I've been lucky enough to work for 13 years, a period of total joy. Um, I mean, you know, to work with people, all of whom are at least 25 years younger than me, and most of whom are probably 50 years younger than me, that's a pretty good thing. <laughs> a lot of fun, and the work is great. So let me start with something that Justice Brandeis said and something that Shakespeare said and use those to get going into substance. Uh, Brandeis, in one of his famous dissents, uh, had a piece of real wisdom about federalism in America, where he said, fortunately, we have a system where a courageous state can put forward innovations uh, for examination by the rest of the country so that a courageous state can serve as a laboratory for democracy. Well, a courageous city can do exactly the same thing, and New York City, through its campaign finance law, has served as a laboratory of democracy for our nation and has brought us lessons which should be followed in the whole country, state by state, city by city, and the nation as a whole. Shakespeare, in As You Like It, had an expression which was, sweet are the uses of adversity. And it's true. From adversity can come good. Uh, and that has definitely been true when you think about reform in the campaign finance system and reform more generally throughout the country of the United States. Um, scandal has often spawned reform. We had, as Larry touched on, and I'll elaborate on in greater detail, a bad scandal in this city in the mid-80s, and it did spawn the drive that led to the Campaign Finance Act. And today in the country, we surely do have a scandal of, as Amy, the second director of the wonderful Campaign Finance Board, said, we do have a scandal in this country of too much money in politics. The Supreme Court facilitated that phenomenon, but it surely didn't cause it. We have an enormous problem of too much money in politics, and small donor matching is a way to address that. There are other things that need to be done. The Citizens United decision needs to be reversed when we have a different Supreme Court. The culture needs to be changed. We do need to think about jurisprudence harder and recognize that it's not free speech when you pour so much money into an election that you drown out other voices and you discourage people from voting. And those are the 
the fundamental harms caused by money and politics that ultimately are going to lead to an overturn of the path the Supreme Court set us on and our country as a whole has embarked upon of pouring money, too much money, into elections. Now, let's talk a little bit about the um, law in New York and how it happened. The creation, as Larry mentioned, is definitely due to the corruption scandal that existed in New York. Actually, um, Ed Koch and I, from 1982, had been talking uh, about the need to reform campaign finance. He'd made a couple of speeches about it. I had written to him three or four memos about it, but it, it wasn't happening. Then there were really two scandals in New York. The first was New York City used to be governed by something called the Board of, Board of Estimate, uh, which the 1989 charter that I chaired finally put to death. Um, it was a system where eight public officials, the mayor, the controller, the city council president, which had a different name then, and the five borough presidents, voted on most important land use decisions, whether zoning should be changed, that's a global kind of decision, and also whether a particular developer should be allowed to build a big building in a particular place. And you began to see huge, and under New York state law, the contributions that lawfully can be given are huge huge contributions going to members of the Board of Estimate after a vote on either an enormously lucrative contract or a very important real estate deal. And that, that was something which was the beginnings of a scandal. It was a scandal and it was bothering people. Then in 1986, or it, perhaps it was the end of 85, it was revealed that the borough president of Queens, the Democratic Party leader in the Bronx, and other New York City politicians were taking bribes for various deals, particularly through the um, transportation department. And this was a, a real scandal because it was actual bribes, not just political contributions, which are bribes disguised in a, <laughs> another in another package, um, and the 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 borough president of Queens ultimately killed himself, stabbing himself in the chest with a knife, as his father had done also, uh, and the. Um, county leader, Democratic county leader in the Bronx was convicted in a trial that uh, Rudy Giuliani tried himself. And so Koch, Giuliani was the uh, U.S. attorney at this time, and he clearly in his political ambitions wanted to go after Ed Koch in connection with these scandals. Um, now, Ed Koch was personally, totally honest person. He really didn't care about money. Um, and he was definitely an honest person. Nonetheless, Giuliani was going after him. The New York Post was sort of barking at, its, at, at him. And he was um, very concerned about what to do. <clears throat> Just a little vignette about Koch as a person. I'd been planning to leave my job as corporation counsel after four years plus a couple of months to stay around to argue a case in the US Supreme Court. Um, and, but I went to Ed and I said, Ed, I'm gonna stay, I'm not gonna leave after that Supreme Court argument. I'm gonna stay with you until you're completely out of this um, effort to taint you with the corruption. And 
this little uh, vignette about the mayor is not one that most people would think could possibly have happened. He actually cried when I told him that. Cried because I guess he felt um, that it was nice for someone to be loyal to him and he felt grateful for that. So as Larry said, my advice to the mayor is don't just deny it or don't just wait. Take the offense. And I use Shakespeare's quote with him, think that adversity can be sweet and that sweet are the uses of adversity and take advantage of the furor about the corruption to fight for government reform, and he did for a lot of things. But definitely the most important was that there should be some kind of change in the system of money and politics in New York City. Uh, the, the, we had a legal problem, which was the state law governs the amount of money that can be given. Um, the solution I came up with, and when I left, the New York Times wrote a nice editorial about my service as corporation counsel, and they finished saying the council should adopt this idea, uh, but it wasn't as good idea as, as what the city ultimately did. But my idea was that the city would uh, pass a law that would say any entity that gives more than X dollars in a political contribution to a city official uh, or whose high executive gives more than Y dollars to a city official as a political contribution is ineligible to do business with the city. And th that probably would have worked pretty well. Now, would today's Supreme Court hold it constitutional or not? I don't know. But it would have been held constitutional back then and I, I think it would be held constitutional now. But after I left office, uh, Peter Zimroth, my successor, had a much better idea of how to get around the fact that state law hangs over the New York City uh, rules on how much can be contributed. And Peter came up with the idea, which is the structure of the law, the now campaign finance law, that if people join voluntarily, and after having joined voluntarily, they agree to limit the size of contributions and limit the amount of expenditures, then they're having acted voluntarily. There's no legal problem under state law. And that, that's the device that was adopted for the city system. Um, Another hero, I mean, so Ed Koch was a hero. Actually, I think you could say he lost his primary um, challenge to David Dinkins in 1989 because of the campaign finance law that he had um, engineered. Uh, I don't think David would have beaten Ed Koch without the money that he got on a matching basis under the original campaign finance law, but that, that's speculation. But certainly Ed Koch was a hero because of his pushing very early, starting in 1986, for reform, fundamental basic reform of the New York City campaign finance system. Uh, Peter Zimroth was a hero for being creative in devising a structure that would um, protect against, stop too much money in politics. And then the other hero was Peter Vallone, Peter Vallone Sr., who was then the speaker of the city council and who marshaled the law through the council, even though, as he said, it is not usual for elected officials to vote for a system that's going to finance people who are going to challenge them. So it was a remarkable act that Peter was able to get um, an overwhelming bipartisan, well, that's not a very important point because when you think, when I was doing the city charter and we looked at the structure of the city government, we said problem number one, leaving the legal problems aside, 
fundamental problem number one is race in the city. We, there's a terrible racial divide and we should do things to help address that. Uh, problem which we did by expanding the size of the city council principally that ended up with a body that was 50% minority when before it had been about, on a smaller basis, it had been about 15% minority. And just expanding the size of districts, uh, uh, the, yeah, the number of districts and therefore um, s lowering the size of the districts increased the minority. And then the second uh, real problem in the city was jealousy of Manhattan, people who don't live in Manhattan feeling they were not really taken seriously. And the third one was, and it was less important by far than the other two, but that we had really a one-party government in New York City so that the Republican minority leader in the city council was also the only Republican in the city council. <laughs> Uh, that's a little better now, you know, it's, it's a little more representative now than it was before. But uh, that, that was an aside about what we were thinking about were important to do in the charter and Peter Vallone's job in bringing together the people who, uh, but it still was true that he persuaded council members uh, to vote for a bill that was going to enable people to challenge them in a realistic way. Now, another thing to talk about is the importance of how the campaign finance board got started. And I would single out two things. It is not, I mean, just as a conclusion, if you compare the New York City campaign finance board with the State Board of Elections or the Federal Election Commission, both of those are stalemated by partisan division. Uh, I think both of those have an even number of members and they're the Republican members and the Democratic members and they've developed a tradition of always voting separately and in a partisan basis and splitting the commission and therefore disabling the commission from acting. The New York City Campaign Finance Board was set up with five members, two appointed by the mayor, two appointed by the council speaker, and the chairman appointed by the mayor upon notification or discussion with the council speaker. But the way it's structured you're not going to have a division, you know, half one party, half another. Uh, the, the two, leaving the chair aside, the two appointees of the speaker and the two appointees of the mayor have to come from different parties. And those have not ended up being one Democrat, one Republican, one Republican, one Democrat. There's generally been someone from a third party who is the second appointee of either the council speaker or the mayor. So you have on the commission a um, structure that at least encourages nonpartisan decision making. But I think even more important than that structural point in how the campaign finance board got started were the, was the tradition established by the original chair and the original executive director. Original chair was Father Joseph O'Hare um, from Fordham, a marvelous man. He served for three terms, 15 years, and the original executive director was Nicole Gordon, who's sitting somewhere in here, who served for 18 years, and the two of them established a tradition within the commission members and among the staff of simply addressing things on the merits without any consideration of the partisan implications of a decision. 
either a decision affecting a particular individual or general decisions to be made by the board as a whole. And that tradition, certainly by the time that I came in as the second chair, the, um, that tradition was absolutely solid. You, you were not going to have a partisan viewpoint coming up from the staff or being taken by the board. So th that tradition was enormously important and we are greatly in debt to both Nicole and Father O'Hare. Now, the next thing is that the um, law, the original law, had a very important provision in it that said after each election, the Campaign Finance Board is required to hold hearings on how well or how not well the law worked and where it might be improved. And that's done after every single election. Uh, a report is required. I think the report is not just required, but the board has to recommend whether they think there are changes that should be made. And forcing the body to think about how well is it doing in achieving its objectives and what could be done to do better is a very healthy thing. And it's a public, transparent process, too. Uh, the, the hearings are open, and the discussion is open, and the report, obviously, is public. That, that I think, has been very, very, very healthy for the Campaign Finance Board and its improvement. A lot of improvements have, in fact, been made. I'm going to detail some of, the, some of them uh, after concentrating on what I think is the single most important, important improvement that's been made over the course of the history of the Campaign Finance Board. And that is the changes in the matching fund amount and multiplier. The first law provided for a one-to-one -one match on the first $1,000. Then in the summer of 2000, uh, I believe it was, I know it was in 2000, um, the law was changed to a four-to-one match on the first 250,000. Then uh, in, I think, 07 or 06, the law was changed to a six to one match on the first 175,000. Going back to the change to four to one, this was the second time that I personally got involved in the, these issues, the first having been with Koch and pushing for there being a major new law. Uh, but Mayor Giuliani, for some reason, brought a lawsuit saying it was illegal to change from one to one on 1,000 to four to one on 250. And the Campaign Finance Board, and Nicole, I guess it was, I'm sure it was, asked me to do an amicus brief and to intervene on behalf of candidates in the forthcoming election of 2001 in defense of the four to one match, the change to a four to one match. And we, I did that and we got about 40 affidavits from candidates for the forthcoming election, candidates for every office, the citywide offices, the borough presidents and the council. And the basic thrust of all of those affidavits was we will change our method of campaigning if smaller gifts are given a larger match. And this, this was very effective um, facts put forward by people ranging from candidates to mayor, for mayor, to candidates for lots of city council offices. Um, but let's jump ahead to the six to one match and then talk about its impact. Actually, I proposed an eight to one match and that was opposed by the new mayor, Mayor Bloomberg, 
I'm not quite sure what his logic was, but he did oppose it. And what came out was a six to one match on the first 175. And there are some studies that show what that has in fact done. And it has done what those affidavits predicted the lesser change of four to one on 250 would do. It has changed the behavior of candidates running for office in New York City. And I think Michael Malbin has done some research on this that's very powerful and very important. Because what it does is give people an incentive to, instead of dialing for big dollars, going to meet people for small dollars. And you can see what, what it can do. You get six to one on the first $50. It's for, on the first 175. But let's say you're someone who can't possibly give more than $50. But when you're told that if you give 50, the candidate's going to get 350, six times 50 plus the original 50, that's a real incentive. And it has incentivized people to participate in campaigns. And, and by the way, a little aside on that related to that subject. Some reformers act and talk as if any gift of money is a bad thing. Money's bad, giving too much money's bad, therefore giving any money is bad. Well, there's a logical flaw in there. It's giving too much money that's bad. Giving a small amount of money is a good thing. It does energize people and convince them that they're part of the effort. Uh, President Obama, in his first campaign, in the huge amounts of money he got from small gifts, definitely that not only helped him from the point of view of getting the money, but it helped him because if you give, you are a participant, you are interested, and the opportunity to be matched uh, increases the likelihood that you will give. So the impact on democracy of the increased matches has been very great. And out of this conference, maybe will come ideas that you could even increase further the impact of let's say small uh, contributions below $100, but increase that impact further. And I'm sure it would have a great impact on the um, New York City's politics and continue New York's role as a laboratory for democracy. So just to tick off a few other things, not as important, I think, but really important that the um, city did do, often and usually in response to the required analysis by the Campaign Finance Board after every election. Uh, they required candidates for citywide office to participate in debates. So if you're in the program and you're way ahead, you can't say, oh, I'm, I'm not going to bother to debate. You have to debate if you're in the program. Uh, then it, it um, li eliminated corporate contributions. It required more disclosure. Most recently, the city charter was amended to require disclosure of independent expenditures. And the law was changed to say that even if you're not in the program, the disclosure obligations apply to you and the limits on contributions apply to you. So th there have been a lot and there are many more and no doubt Amy when, when she talks in her part or if people ask her a question could talk about additional um, changes that were made on behalf of the um, Campaign Finance Board to help the city have an even stronger law. So now to finish up and give you a chance to get on to the great programs, I think uh, the city has been a highly successful laboratory for democracy. And we were lucky that we had adversity and responded to it. And the challenge 
in the city is to continue to improve, and the challenge in the nation is to respond to the adversity of too much money in politics and get a program like the city's program that at least is going to be an alternative to the corrupting system that we now have where there's much too much money in politics. So thank you all.